Hi, my name is Matt, and I uh, wanted to make a short video about my conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A um, couple things you need to know before we start. First, I'm a very unlikely convert to this church. Um, a few years prior to my conversion, I was completely convinced Mormons uh, were part of a scary cult. Uh, if you're an evangelical Christian, or probably just a non-denominational Christian, you've probably heard the same things that I had heard uh, throughout the years. And I understand um, the faith was off the table for me. It, it was not even an option. In fact, I have a journal entry from 2007 um, when I was keeping a journal um, that I was insulted when an atheist said that, you know, Mormons and Christians are all the same. And I it was really upsetting to me. Um, in fact, because of that insult, I remember writing about a 20-page document for myself that pretty much outlined why I believe what I believe um, and wh what it was doctrinally in the Bible that made me believe what I believed. And it, for the most part, uh, my testimony at that time was in direct conflict uh, with the message of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So... Um, if you fit into these same preconditioned beliefs I did, at least hear me out and understand why I uh, converted and consider my testimony. Two, um, my conversion sparked from a very unlikely source. That is to say, um, it was my intense study of really life after death, also known as near-death experiences. Um, my study in this area was as detailed as of anything I've ever done in my life. and. And the conclusions of the study surprised me and had me re-examine what I believed. Um, um, so I also believe that this knowledge is out there for anybody. So I'm going to share with you some areas of, of, of interest that I, I learned and open up to you whether you're interested in studying those three. I think finally that everyone is at their own spiritual level in life. Um, my hope is this discussion might increase your own personal faith and your religion or your denomination or encourage you to pursue your uh, knowledge in other areas that you're not fully you've never considered before um, regardless of where, where that decision leads you so let me give you first characteristics of my faith um, a little bit about my background I was raised in a very conservative church um, it was more fundamentalist in its approach uh, than your typical large non-denominational Christian church today. Um, my parents were very loving and it was very natural in that environment, in my opinion, to um, you know, commit myself to the beliefs of the church I was raised. I was baptized at a young age. Uh, I felt like I was very passionate and knowledgeable about this faith as I grew up. Um, but leaving high school without the influence of my family and my church friends was was difficult and it was overwhelming for me in fact within a few short years of leaving high school i i felt that i had shifted from hot for christ to lukewarm at best um, to often cold for christ and that was a very discouraging part of my life after about a decade of struggling with this on again off again um, i did rededicate myself uh, in my life to a small church um, in various volunteer capacities. Um, more important, I was trying to live out my faith a little bit uh, more hot for Christ. Um, within two years of joining kind of this Bible-based church that I was a part of, this Christian church, um, I was working in an assistant pastoral capacity within the church. Um, <clears throat> but the church was doctrinally much different than the one I grew up in. And I found that found, I found that odd, given that we all had the same set of scriptures. But this is not abnormal across the Christian faiths. In fact, you know, to date there's over forty one thousand denominations. Um, so while I really think that the core belief of those Christian denominations centers on Christ, which was most important to me, I really felt like there had to be absolute truth out there somewhere. Um, and the Bible seemed to suggest that. If I ask with a, a sincere heart and I was open to the spirit of interpretation of these of the scripture that I could indeed have this truth, but it was a little daunting given that all the a lot of people give their lives to a study of a sect or faith of religion, and there are so many disagreements. 
So well understood. Uh, there was a small window in my life where I actually prayerfully considered uh, joining the ministry of some time, of some sort, full time. Um, but the conflict over absolute truth really bothered me uh, a little bit, and it prevented me from making a clear decision. Um, I really fear that choosing a Bible school, uh, I would have to pick a specific area or school to receive a degree, and I felt that I would be told specifically how that church or denomination interpreted and, and uh, kind of formed its theology and its doctrine. Um, and I was concerned that later I would pastor a church and I would be expected to, you know, mold to that kind of denomination or doctrine uh, as certainly I was be a, be a paid member of that church um, to teach in that capacity. Um, now, while I could not tell you which church was doctrinally correct, I can tell you the Mormons had it wrong on several areas. And to be honest, that's what I was told most of my life. So it shouldn't surprise you. In 2007, I received a uh, no-notice deployment to Afghanistan. Um, when I left, my wife gave me a book called My Descent into Death by Howard Storm. Um, this would be my first exposure to near-death experiences for me. And I was very skeptical before I read it. Um, that being said, I do remember the exact moment I read this book and how deeply it affected me. Um, for one of the first times in my life, I truly felt God's unfailing love for his children. Um, Howard Storm's conversion to atheist to full-time gospel preacher was relatively immediate for him. Um, Forty years later, you can still find Howard Storm sharing his testimony uh, across the world with perfect recollection. Uh, his story is amazingly profound to me and convincing, um, and his book, it was really what set off for me years of passionate study on the subject of near-death experiences or life essentially after death and what that was like. Um, I was most interested at this point in the correlation of these experiences with theology or doctrine of the church and really what the Bible taught and whether those were in conflict with each other. Um, for those that have never heard of near this experiences, um, I will tell you that the intensity of conversion for a lot of people is, is quite profound. Um, their experience in death is more real to them than this life. Um, typically, the experience teaches them a profound truth meant as personal revelation to them, or they're told to share their experience to help others grow spiritually. Um, for people that experience death, um, Near-death experiencers are frequently convicted to seek the light of Christ, which is to say that to love one another as God loves us. It's kind of a simple message. Um, really, millions of people from all walks of faith have seen and experienced the same things behind the veil, as we'll say. So much so that kind of these experiences have moved beyond kind of con conjecture um, and hypothesis and plausibility to kind of the level of documented fact, in my opinion, um, you could certainly disagree with that, but I don't. Um, so after coming back from Afghanistan, uh, I felt led spiritually with my family to move away from the small church that I was serving. Um, there are a number of reasons I made this decision, but after I made this decision, I kind of panicked because I, I wasn't really sure where to go. No church seemed to fit my family. I looked up doctrinal beliefs of different denominations, and they just didn't really seem to fit where we were being spiritually led. Um, my wife and I had a very unique understanding at this point. She was also pretty compulsive about studying near-death experience and, and had been for at least a decade prior to me. Um, and we both were coming to a level of understanding of life after death and just the way we were to live our lives that just made us feel not uncomfortable in churches, but just not really spiritually fed. And something was missing. We just, it was that missing element that maybe you felt at a church before, and maybe you found salt in another church that you've gone to. It was just something was missing. Um, now, there were a number of themes surrounding these experiences that are important um, that I'd like to go into and I'd like to share. Now, first of all, a lot of the consistent themes I've left off my list um, because they don't give you a sense of what led me to the church. Uh, and for me, what became the highest available truth that I could find. Um, for example, 
there's extreme consistencies about how people die, the feeling of dying, what happens immediately after you die, what you see, what you feel, what you hear, how you communicate. Um, all these things, while they are amazing, uh, they were not the core issues that shaped my understanding of maybe God's eternal plan for his children. Um, finally, not everyone that dies will have an experience on this list. I understand that. Um, there's varying levels of information relayed to each person that experiences life after death. Um, it's my opinion that God intends to maintain the individual's personal freedom and therefore very few people get everything or are allowed to remember everything uh, after death. Uh, the veil is again put up before their minds and they, they forget a lot of things. Um, it really took me hundreds and hundreds of near-death experiences to start to put together what I would call the puzzle. Each experience is a puzzle and another experience puts together another puzzle. So here is a summation of the core concepts that we wrote down um, before we did any investigation kind of of a religion. These are the things that we thought were important. Um, first, a predominant theme surrounding near-death experiences is the pre-mortal existence, uh, pre existence of our spirits. It was absolutely clear to me. There was no doubt about it. That was a very central theme to these experiences. We are just as spiritually alive before our birth and after life as we are in this life, if not more so. We are literally sons and daughters of, of God. Um, the ability to come to this earth is indeed an incredible opportunity for spiritual growth. And our time here is about spiritual growth and preparing to return back home with our Heavenly Father. Um, along in the same core lines, our memory, we don't remember this, obviously, um, and our memory was removed because if it was not, we would not have the same level of choice that we have today. Freedom to choose is a very critical piece of God's love for us, and it will allow us to grow to our high, highest spiritual potential. Um, but there's also a risk of the loss of eternal rewards, depending on how we use this precious gift. And so, it is not to be taken lightly. You can choose good and you can choose evil. Um, and that is God's gift to us, believe it or not. Um, second, there were degrees of glory in the afterlife, um, depending on how much you grew spiritually on this earth and became like Jesus Christ. Um, almost like a judgment based on your works in some capacity, but you're not saved from hell because of your works per se. Um, levels of glory. Um, there were levels of t torment in hell, and there were levels of glory in heaven that definitely existed. Um, but the two bipolar side of heaven only all the glory, burning in hell forever, and those were the only two things, and that's the way I grew up, it was not fully clear to me at all. Um, and so in many cases, those near-death experiences were only able to achieve a certain level of understanding or glory or reside in a certain level of glory because of how much light they had based on the decisions they made in mortality. They were very aware in some cases that there were further levels of glory that they could not see for whatever reason because they were not spiritually ready or they had not achieved a point where they would be comfortable being there. Um, Third thing, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are indeed separate beings, um, but one in love and purpose. Uh, Jesus Christ is one with the Father in the exact same manner that Christ wants us to be one with him. But that oneness, the desire to have oneness, does not revoke our tangible identities, um, nor does it suggest that Christ was the Heavenly Father. Um, there are few people that I've read about that have witnessed these beings, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, in their near-death experience, and they know without a doubt which, which one is which, which individual is which. Um, so it's, it, that was clear to me. Um, fourth, the message of Christ, though not in all experiences, the, of Christ's love and God's love will be preached to those in the spirit world that have not had an opportunity to hear it or grow or have been limited in their knowledge and exposure to this knowledge. 
Um, and so some level of progression was possible after life. Um, I did not fully understand it at the time, though. Um, fifth, this is most important. Um, I learned through these near-death experiences that we have to learn to love others to sacrifice service and charity. And really, charity is, in, is really essential, and Christ is our perfect example. In no cases did I read that Christ put any emphasis on a denominational belief, period, dot, and of the individual um, at all outside of his or her faith. Um, what was really critical is faith in Jesus Christ and growing in love as I've previously discussed. Um, Howard Storm, the atheist example that I used before, was in fact told when he asked about this, to join the church that brought him the closest to God. And there's a lot of deep truths with that response. And I think you could probably process that. You need to join the church that brings you closest to God. Um, again, this goes back to the concept of individual freedom. So while there might be a perfected church, and there probably is, Christ is not going to tell someone in an experience that they should join XX denomination that is beyond and that's completely in violation of his law of freedom, individual freedom. Okay, so those were the main themes that were really important to me. Now, uh, obviously, we decided not to talk to a lot of people about these of, of these concepts within our faith. Concepts like pre-mortal and post-mortal existence are not very well understood or agreed upon in Christian circles. Um, in fact, none of the Christian denominations that we studied supported pre-mortal existence of the soul, not a single major church, period. It, it was not available. We looked. It was not an option. I believe a reason maybe for this is the Bible certainly seems to be open to interpretation on some of these issues, and maybe churches don't want to make a decision or stance on them. Um, and there's some level of evidence to suggest that the early church fathers talked about some of these concepts, but they were discarded at some point in history from the mainstream faith. Um, my frustration grew a little bit, however, um, and here's why. The Holy Spirit seemed to confirm the truth of these experiences, these thousands of experiences. And I was able to discern a lot of the truths within my own scripture study. Um, but if they were true and God was pouring out his spirit on all these people and telling them to come back with this knowledge, there was a disconnect about these subjects being well known within the church. Now, I, I did study the evangelical stance on near-death experiences, so let me be clear about this. Um, there has to be, in my opinion, some purpose for these people having been to the other side and come back to tell about it. Um, to whitewash it and say that if it's not clearly understood in Scripture, then God does not want us to know about it, it was unacceptable to me. And I did not respect this overall opinion that if, if God wanted us to know about it, he put it in the Bible. Um, I think that it was overwhelming that God wanted people to know this information. Um, so this weighed on me until my wife and I ordered um, this final book I'll talk about called I Stand All Amazed uh, by Elaine Durham. It was a great book. It was this book that convinced my wife to really order the Book of Mormon. And let me explain why. So after being clinically dead uh, for over an hour, um, there was a profound revelation made to Elaine Durham by Christ and angelic beings. Um, and when she asked a single question, she said, what is the right church or which church is the right church? She had been seeking her whole life. She didn't really know much about denominations. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to know, obviously. Now, to be very clear, Elaine Durham was not a Mormon, did not know anything about the faith at the time of her experience, nor would it be in her best interest to come up with the answer that Mormonism the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the right church. Um, if she was trying to make money, that just doesn't sell very well in mainstream Christian circles, and it would probably be readily rejected. Um, so the answer she received was very specific, um, but it did maintain a very sensitive requirement of freedom that allowed her to find this perfected church on her own. 
So I want to quote directly from Elaine Durham's book uh, called I Stand All Amazed. Quote, I was informed that it was, quote, not the right church, but it was the perfect church, which was part of heaven and had been created there. It was des designated as perfect because it composed of the perfect organizational structure and taught as saving doctrines and ordinances, the perfect or complete truth known by God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. In its perfected state, Christ's church had been brought to earth and been given to mortals. However, it did not take long to begin to change the church and cause it to lose its truth. We put up walls that divided the church as we sought power, wealth, honor, glory, and worldly lust, as well as through fears that we instilled within each other. In this condition, the perfect church became so weakened that it fragmented into numerous less perfect churches. I was told by the angel that these churches all have portions of the truth, but that only the church as it was created in heaven has all of it. Though I was not informed which church it was, I was told that Christ's heavenly church is on the earth again today, organized just like it was in the days of old, and that if I desired to find it, I would find it. I would recognize among this people the same spirit of peace and joy that I had felt with Jesus and the angels in this higher spiritual realm. As a matter of fact, before Elaine Durham came back, it said she, it would take her about 15 to 20 years to find this church, yeah. and if she tried, she would find it. So indeed, it took Elaine Durham 15 years after coming back to life to find the same spirit. The moment she met the missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, she understood their doctrine. She knew that she had found the perfected church. The Holy Spirit convicted her exactly as she was described. Her story at least convinced my wife to order the Book of Mormon. Um, and in fact, she went to the local LDS ward that Sunday. Uh, now, this was pretty much about the time I freaked out. I literally thought that my wife was going to join a cult. And I remember being very, very upset about it. I was actually a mess that Sunday, I'll be honest. I remember praying that God would find us a church that was doctrinally sound, but yet balance the truths that we seem to be reinforced over and over in these experiences that we both were so passionate about. I actually told God that I had no hope unless he showed me the way, and I fully and completely surrendered my will in this area, absolutely. Um, it was not long after that panic that I also read Elaine Durham's book, and I at least understood why my wife ordered the Book of Mormon and why she began investigating. So it was at this point I convinced myself that I needed to put off the preconceived notions of this church. And given the, my deep-seated probably misunderstandings about the Mormons, the reality is it would be nearly impossible to convert me unless the Holy Spirit confirmed its truth to me. So... In the off time between missionary visits, uh, there was not an issue I did not study or pray about. And here's some, the apostasy, the core beliefs of the Christian church as recorded by early Christian historians and church fathers, archaeological proofs to the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith's life, the Book of Abraham, multiple doctrinal issues like the Godhead and the Trinity, whether a man could forge the book, fingerprints of Hebrewisms in the Book of Mormon, uh, the detailed book and our life and testimony of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Between these researches, I also read the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, Book of Abraham, um, Book of Moses. Um, because I was also scared of being misled, I also researched opposing arguments uh, to the faith to include a number of individuals that had left the church, almost like their deconversion testimony. Um, in the end, the, the reality is the Spirit strongly testified of the truth of this church. Um, I was stunned at its amazing capacity to relay a pure gospel message of Jesus Christ. Um, and that it had a unique strength in its teachings on the atonement of Jesus Christ. It had a lot of consistencies with the Godhead, as understood by the first saints of the Christian faith um, and the early church fathers. The power of their understanding of the spirit world in pre-mortal and post-mortal experiences um, with well-defined levels of glory. 
the the organization of the church was undeniably perfected. Um, you know, it was the most amazing aspect for me really came to this conclusion is that it was revelation to prophets, or so they said, that over 150 years ago that perfect perfectly captured the truths that were confirmed through hundreds of near-death experiences that my family and I had studied. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints understands the most basic and deeply revealed truths of those people that come back from life after death. Um, there was no possible way that the Latter-day Saint faith synergized so clearly with the most profound truths being relayed in modern near-death experiences unless it was part of the restored message and now part of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To even fathom of some of these concepts in the early 1800s is really incredible given that they were not even part of our religious language at the time. Um, they've only really become part of our language in the last 20 to 30 years, but really the last 10 to 15 through the internet. Um, these truths were absolutely and divinely revealed through the church. There were no doubt about it that they were core doctrine of the church. Um, Near-death experiences in LDS scriptures were per perfectly harmonious. Um, when this journey was all said and done, I recognized immediately that I, had, I felt I had borne false witness against this church and its people. Um, when it came time to be interviewed for my baptism into the church, actually, it required more faith to doubt than to believe in the truths of the church. Um, when I ex accepted the message of the restored gospel, a uh, peace entered my soul I had not previously known. And within a white week, my wife and I were both baptized in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it's Christmas 2014, and it's been nearly a year since my conversion to the church. And really, my conversion was only a start of my spiritual journey uh, and towards perfected knowledge of the truth of our existence. Um, I'm overjoyed that there were deeper, intense studies accomplished by Latter-day Saints in the area of near-death experiences, and they correlated and pulled thousands of additional resources that continued to build my testimony on every single doctrine of the church every single doctrine of the church, um, to include all the temple work that is being done. Um, every doctrine of this faith has been witnessed to by those that have journeyed beyond the veil of death and speak of a testimony of this church's great truths. Um, this faith literally, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm a member, it literally for me solved every conflict that I had about doctrine. Um, and I struggled with doctrine for a lot of years. Um, this church was essentially for me, I tell people, it's the missing puzzle that I almost never found because I hardened my heart and I allowed others to fill my mind with half-truths against the faith. Um, I'm, I want to attest to the truth of the message that the Book of Mormon stands as solely just another witness to Jesus Christ when he went amongst his other sheep. It was preserved and prophesied to come forth for this final restored and perfected gospel dispensation. I know that the perfected church of Jesus Christ exists on the earth uh, exactly as it was designed to exist, exactly as has been designed in heaven. And that the knowledge given through revelation by the prophets and the apostles of this church is perfecting the knowledge of our spiritual existence and expectations that God has for us as we will walk in this life so that we can return to him. Um, it's also sanctifying, uh, the church is also sanctifying its believers to develop into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and to follow the divine will of our Father in heaven. It's really undeniable. Um, so that really is my testimony. Um, to give you a couple resources that were value, valuable to me as I searched for the truth. A book called How Wide the Divide, A Mormon and Evangelical in Conversation. This is required reading before you should even engage on any anti-Mormon dialogue. If you have, you probably have more in common than you think. Um, Joseph Smith, Rough, Rough Stone Rolling. 
I, I think it was a fair assessment of Joseph Smith's life. Historically, Mormons and non-Mormons appreciated this amazing work. Um, and a newsflash to everyone, prophets aren't perfect. They were not designed to be perfect. They will never be perfect. The only man that lived a sinless life was the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Um, a Marvelous Work and a Wonder by Legrand Richards. This is an older writing of the church about the marvelous nature of this church and its claims to the restoration of the fullness of the gospel. Investigating the Book of Mormon Witnesses by Richard Anderson. Um, there were three witnesses that bore, uh, bore of their testimony of seeing the plates by an angel and testified to this fact. It's in the beginning of the Book of Mormon. Um, this was a very important book for me, and I think it's one of the best first-hand accounting of the lives and testimony that these men took to their graves, and it was an incredible testimony of the truthfulness of this gospel. Um, the complete anti-Nicene or anti-Nicene, pre-Nicene Church Father Collection, heads up. This thing is over 18,000 pages. I tried to focus on early Church Fathers, you know, the people that were there right when the Apostles died and some of their early church writings. Um, and before you presuppose that you fully reject the LDS view of the Godhead, um, you might want to familiarize yourself with some of their uh, doctrines and writings. Um, the beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are not unlike many beliefs that existed in the ancient church, and they're not unlike a lot of beliefs that have existed among smaller sects and denominations in the last 150 years. Um, restoring the Ancient Church, um, Joseph Smith and Ancient Christianity, probably a better book than reading the pre-Nicene Fathers. This is really an argument for the church being a full restoration of the gospel. Um, and I think, again, it's an easier and better read. Um, articles of Faith by James Talmadge. Um, there are 13 articles of faith to define the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, written about by Joseph Smith. This is written, this book is written from a, one of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1911, and it's a deep dive into each of those articles of faith so that people understand some of the defining doctrines of the church that have not changed nor will change. Um, Jesus the Christ by the same writer, James Talmadge, great book, a uh, little bit thick. Again, I was pretty obsessed with um, understanding the core beliefs and understanding the church's position on this most magnificent um, figure in human history that really defines the Christian faith. A uh, really great book. Near-Death Experiences, there's not a time to go through every one of these books online um, that we've read, uh, postings, so I'm going to flash some of these books across right now that I've enjoyed through the years. Remember, each experience is only a single data point and must be taken in light of Scripture and various serious uh, reflection and prayer and promptings of the Holy Spirit felt during this readings. Um, the more we progress in a digital online, share, online and shared world, um, the more easy it will be to become a copycat in several areas, and near-death is probably one of those. Um, it's a reason that I like older experiences that were published well before the advent and the popularity of the internet, like pre mid 1990s, let's say, or pre 1990s, even better, the 60s and early 1900s. Um, a couple of books I really enjoyed, I've already mentioned it. I stand all amazed by Elaine Durham. Um, Roy Mills, uh, The Soul's Remembrance, a really great book. Uh, this individual is very unique, in my opinion. He remembered his life in the pre mortal state. Um, not many people have been able to do that. A uh, great testimony to pre-mortal existence. One of the original uh, ordered to return by George Ritchie. George Ritchie is kind of the first person that was willing to come forth and document formerly near-death experiences. Angie Finnamore, um, Beyond the Darkness, My Journey uh, to Hell and Back. Uh, interesting experience and interesting some of the things that she learned. Um, and there's others. Um, after my conversion, as I mentioned, I was overjoyed to find that there were scholars inside of this faith that have already dissected thousands of experiences, more so than I had, and they balanced their understandings with the doctrines of the church. So let me give you a couple of these. Um, I liked They Saw Beyond Death, um, 
by Arvin Gibson. He's written a couple great books, a lot of great books that, that anchor the study of near-death experiences with the doctrines of the church. Um, life Everlasting. Life Everlasting is probably the most intense doctrinal book on what the church believes about life after death. Um, a pretty, pretty good book. Um, another book called um, Gaze into Heaven. I'll show you this on my iPad here. Gaze into Heaven. The reason I really like this book is because they were near-death experiences from early church history. Mormons were devout at writing journals, and they wrote journals that captured their near-death experiences um, and the correlation of these. They could not have had a conspiracy to conspire with each other while they wrote these experiences, so it's quite amazing. Another one I recently received, uh, you know, last week, and I love it also from Arvin Gibson, is Echoes from Eternity, another one that just correlates all the near-death experiences together. If you want to know what the church believes on near-death experiences in the simplest form, what is on the other side? What does the gospel teach us about the spirit world? Probably the easiest, easiest thinnest read. It doesn't go into near-death experiences. It just goes into church doctrine. Um, if you want to also research other doctrinal discourses online, I've already mentioned a lot of things I've studied. I'll flash some of those up here. Um, even, again, James Talmadge writes about the great apostasy, a pretty simple read, and other great books um, as well. Um, there's some online studies. Most of you won't go to LDS.org, I get it, or Mormon.org, um, although those clearly say what the church believes. If you're an investigator like me, they can't be telling the truth. Um, so I kind of went to Mormons that were more apologetic, when I was first coming to the truthfulness of the church, one of my favorite, favorite websites um, that I really, really loved was uh, if you go to jefflindsay.com, just jefflindsay.com. He does LDS frequently asked questions, Mormon answers. And if it's a discussion or an issue that you have, it is in here. And it's a lot of the reason that I read several other books. So again, a great, great, great resource. Um, to you. Uh, Fair Mormon is also another one. Again, the apologetic research of the church is quite profound. I don't need, I'm not here to be an apologist. So when it's all said and done, uh, the additional studies I give you are great, but the reality is the Holy Spirit, it, it really confirms all truth. And it's not simply just head knowledge. I do leave people with a generic challenge. Um, read the Book of Mormon, um, study some of these concepts, and with a sincere heart, pray to ask God if it's true to receive a witness of the truthfulness. Um, there are people that say, don't pray about these things because there's nothing else out there. Um, I'm not asking you to pray on whether Islam is true. I'm not asking you to read the Quran. I would never ask you to read something that does not anchor their core doctrinal belief on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That would be against my understanding of the Bible and the Word of God, and I wouldn't be willing to do it. But people use that as an excuse, that it's not the Word of God, therefore they won't read it. Um, you are doing yourself a great disservice by not at least reading the book for no other reason than just to be enlightened on some of the great literature that's in there. Um, read Alma 32 on faith. And ask me, ask yourself, is there a better discourse on faith and growing in faith? There's not. Um, as I close out, my final note, and this is the most important. The most important message uh, of those that have seen beyond death is simple. It is to love others through service, sacrifice, and charity. Christ being our perfect example. Regardless of your faith, I hope that this message encourages you to seek the light of Jesus Christ. Love one another and support one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of your differences in belief. Um, thank you for allowing me to share my testimony of the truthfulness of this church, especially around Christmas, which is such a great season to think about the Savior that was born in a manger um, to really become the salvation and the Savior of all of mankind. Um, 
if this touched you in any way and you want to share it with those that are not believers or those that are searching, um, please share it with someone you know. And uh, God bless everybody.